The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, Paul, you can jump right in. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our next edition of Just, At, Just Ask Paul. My name is Paul Brankleon. I'm the Director of Research, Education, and Technology here at NADCA. And what we have is a series of questions uh, from diecasters that have come in in various formats, and I have put together several answers on, on these questions. So let's jump right into it. And so we're going to go through several questions today, and the format will be that I'm going to show the question, and then I'll go through the answers to each one of these questions. So the first question is from a diecaster in the Midwest, and we have metal dripping from our ceramic ladles between the holder and the shot sleeve and the pour hole. What are some techniques or other things that can be done to eliminate this issue? So I'm going to break this question down into several components. First is we're going to talk about techniques. So what are some techniques or what are other options to uh, eliminate that foil and that foil that comes from the ladle itself that comes on the back of the ladle? And then what are options to eliminate this? And then at the very end, we're going to talk about standard ladle techniques. So the first thing I want to just touch on is, is different types of furnaces. So you can use, and, and I'm showing just a Stotec here, but you can use a Westhoven or any other type of furnace. That's a launder furnace. So this furnace pumps air using air pressure and it pumps it down a trough and then into the shot sleeve or um, cold chamber, whatever you call that, whatever your company calls that, and, and goes into the shot sleeve. And, and by using that, you're not seeing any foil, you're not seeing any uh, material in between the holding furnace and the die cast machine. So you can, we can go to a different type of furnace altogether and how the metal is pumped. So if we're using a dosing furnace uh, and then a, a launder in between there, and I'll show you a picture of that, we wanna make sure that we're using a non-wetting ceramic type launder that's heated. And heated is recommended. Now, a lot of launders are not heated, but if it's heated, you're going to then prevent a skull that's going to form on the bottom of that launder. So, um, also, if you're going to be using a ladle, so and then I'm going to show you a picture of this also. The ladle itself is, you can use a standard ladle, like a rim rock or a snare or any type of other ladle system. And... You can also use a five axis robot as a ladle. So depending on what type of device you're using, you can also manipulate that device to get rid of that foil that exists. So here's the launder. So this is a, a launder coming from a dosing furnace into a shot sleeve and the metal is traveling in this direction. And with that metal traveling in this direction, you end up with a skull on the bottom of the launder itself. So you want to eliminate that skull where you can. And, and so by heating this launder, you then don't build that skull up in the bottom. But it is a way then to eliminate all this flash and debris and buildup that happens between the ladle and the pour hole. Another option I mentioned just a minute ago is, is using a five axis robot. And with that robot, you can then use a ladle on that robot and you can put a small slit. So whether you're using a five axis robot or you're using a rim rock type system or snare or any of various others, Ube and, and everyone else that have these, Toshiba, uh, by putting this slot in the back of the ladle, you can make sure you get the ladle beneath the surface. So if this was the surface of our metal, Instead of tipping the, the ladle and having that metal come into the ladle, we want to fill it subsurface. And if we keep this edge sharp, so instead of having a rounded corner here, we keep that sharp, we limit the amount of foil that could potentially build up on this edge and then be transferred between the dip well and the chamber itself. Another option is to change the furnace completely. Instead of going to a dosing furnace, go to something like this Meltec. So 
this Meltec device actually uses a ceram ceramic unit. It actually creates a vacuum. It goes down into the dip well. So this is the dip well, the furnace. It then draws the material up into this like a syringe. Then it transfers it to the holding pot and or to the uh, shot sleeve. And then it drops the metal into the shot sleeve. Well, because of this cone shape, you can actually put this well into the shot sleeve and, and then release the material so it's all completely in the shot sleeve itself. Now, this will eliminate that flashing that occurs in between the dip well and the shot sleeve or any of that dripping between those components. So once again, you can create, solve this problem by putting in different technologies. So here's kind of a, a summary of what I just talked about. So if we use just a conventional multi-link ladler with a conventional ladle bucket, um, you know, pros are going to be it's the most common. Uh, typically, that's going to be what's in most diecast companies. The cons are going to be we get that foil or that flash buildup, you know, between the holding furnace and the pour hole, and so we could be dropping that at any point creating a mess, creating that, that uh, cleanup condition. One option is to then put in a drip pan. So you can put a drip pan in between the dip well and your shot sleeve. And that drip pan is where all the material or the foil is gonna collect as it drops off the ladle uh, in between those points. And then that can be cleaned instead of having that foil fall in any location. One other option I mentioned is the robot or the five axis ladle and making sure we, we get this subsurface so we can actually get the metal beneath and then keep that corner sharp. We still would want to use that whether we're using a conventional ladle or a, a robot ladle. Um, once again, this gives us a little bit more action. So with a five axis ability, we have the ability to manipulate that robot and potentially eliminate that flash. One of the things I'm going to cover right at the end is, uh, and I've seen this done where you put a air blow off, and this air blow off mounts to the side of the dip well. As the ladle comes out, whether it's a five axis robot or whether it's a ladle, you can give that, that point a blast of air. You get a signal from the ladle, you just turn a MAC valve, and you get an air blast, and you blow up from the bottom of the foil. The foil then falls off and, and it falls right back into the dip well itself, where typically that foil is very thin and it's going to remelt. So that's an option, and we'll talk about that here at the end. The dosing furnace, so we can change our material from using standard holding pots, standard furnaces, to either a dosing furnace or a Meltec uh, device. You know, these types are going to eliminate the, the flash or the foil. Um, but you know, typically this is gonna be a large capital investment and there's no short-term solution to getting rid of that foil or that material that comes off the ladles. So to summarize this, we can use traditional ladles, Remrock, Snare, uh, Ube, Toshiba, any of those ladle systems that are out there. Um, but we potentially are gonna get that foil that's gonna accumulate between the dip well and in the shot sleeve, um, we wanna make sure we get rid of that to maintain a good clean environment. So if we use this air blow off on the back of the ladle to remove the foil, you know, we can do this at the dip well so that that foil doesn't travel to the pour hole. We just wanna make sure we try to blow it from the bottom up because then that would potentially break that foil off at that point. We wanna make sure we're using slotted ladles and then <clears throat> when we remove the ladle from the fill position, sometimes we can do it quickly. We don't want to jerk the metal around, but if we do it quickly, it's going to reduce the formation of that foil. And then lastly, if we keep the edge, the edge, we want to keep it, you know, pretty much a knife edge, but not dead sharp. Okay? But also remember the, the more rounded or the larger the radius on that point where the foil is going to form is going to actually uh, tend to have more foil formation. The foil is going to have a larger surface area to grab onto, 
and that foil is going to form at that point. Uh, the aluminum is not going to adhere to the ladle because it's got the ladle coat on it, it's got the ceramic material, but we're going to get that foil that's going to form. So we want that foil to, to break off. So if we give it a sharper point, the foil itself then has mass as we lift out of the uh, dip well, that foil could then break off and, and fall right into the dip well. So those are some suggestions that we can use to eliminate or reduce that foil from going from the dip well to the pour hole. Moving on to question two. So I'll read the question first. The question says, how many BTUs should you expect to remove with a volume, eight ounces, of atomized spray? And then they've given us some assumptions. We wanna assume a 12 second spray time with a three second close. The spray temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The surface dye temperature is 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And they're saying that 95% of the material evaporates and 5% is left as solids that's left behind on the face of the tool. So their question is, are these reasonable estimates? And, and they're looking to have some rationale measurement of what a good spraying time should be. All right, so we're gonna break this question down into its components. So the first thing we're gonna just discuss is the spray lube amount. So the first part of the question says, how many BTUs should you expect to remove with a volume eight ounces of atomized spray? So the first question I have is, well, is the eight ounces of atomized spray, is that fully diluted or is that raw lube? Now, based on the, the way the question was phrased, my assumption is that would be already um, diluted spray lube. So that's the lube and the water that's actually sprayed on the face of the tool. So we're gonna assume eight ounces of fluid. Now, not knowing the full viscosity and, and the density of the lube they're using, just for you know quick math, I went ahead and just said, you know what, let's assume eight ounces of fluid water. So eight ounces of fluid water equals about 0.52 pounds. And the latent heat of vaporization of water is 973 BTUs per pound or 2,264 kilojoules per kilogram. So we wanna know, you know, what's the, uh, how many BTUs should we expect to remove with eight ounces of atomized spray? So if, if the total heat removed using that eight ounces of, of fluid is 973 BTUs times the 0.52 pounds, which is, approximately 505.96 BTUs or 534 kilojoules. Based on some of the facts we were given that 95% evaporates, so we can assume once again that 95% is being given up to the late heat effusion. So we take 95% of the 505.96 BTUs, giving us approximately 480.66 BTUs or 507 kilojoules. So this would be the, the answer to the first part of the question, but I'm gonna get a lot more detail because I don't think we're, we're really looking for that as an answer as to you know, what spray does and, and how can we calculate the BTUs from the spray and the BTUs from the in, internal cooling. So this is the number for eight ounces of water. But remember, we're gonna be using spray lube so we would have to know the, the density and the latent heat effusion of the, that material to actually give the exact BTUs, but it can be calculated. So we're gonna talk about the, the rest of the answer. So what we're looking for is a thermal balance. And, and when we look at heat flow in our diecast dies, we're gonna have the heat coming from the spray or the heat removal coming from the spray and the cooling lines. So at a local level, we're gonna have heat removal from the spray and we're gonna have heat removal from the cooling lines. So when we look at all sources of heat removal from our diecast tool, you know, between one and 20% comes from the actual die spray. And, and I'll show you that calculation based on the uh, uh, inputs that we have in this particular question. About 
40 to 70% to of the cooling ability actually comes from the internal cooling of the tool. And then about five to 10% <clears throat> actually is to the machine because we're seeing thermal transfer from the cover half and the ejector half actually because it's mounted to the platens. So we're seeing a thermal transfer from this piece of steel to this piece of steel and so on and so forth. So we're seeing, you know, 5% is gonna be lost to the machine and, you know, somewhere around 5% is gonna be lost to the atmosphere just the radiation of heat from the tool itself. So this would be how the heat is being removed. And the majority of heat is then being removed from the cooling water. So we wanna make sure we design good internal cooling. The next is gonna be the dye spray. But with dye spray, we wanna minimize dye spray so that we don't just attribute to potential porosity issues in our process. So when we're looking at thermal balance, some of the things that the question didn't give us is, you know, what are the spray parameters? So for a good rule of thumb, we're gonna to wanna to know our spray pressure. Higher spray pressures are gonna be mean better wetting. So there are other spray systems on the market that actually increase the spray pressure. That spray pressure overcomes the Leidenfrost effect, the effect of of the material actually boiling on the surface. And we're gonna talk about that. So we wanna know the pressure that we're spraying. Based on that, we can actually get a better idea of what are the thermal parameters, how much heat is being removed by a specific spray type and spray amount. Then the flow rate, you know, how fast we're putting it on, the angle. If, if we are shooting at 90 degrees, so directly on the die face, that's gonna be the highest removal of heat rate. If, if our angle of our sprayer changes and we move it to 30 degrees, you know, from 90 degrees to 45 degrees to 30 degrees, that angle of impingement on the face of the die is actually gonna actually bounce some of the material off. And so we're gonna see less heat removal. So the angle is important. Composition, I'm gonna show you a graph here in a few minutes on composition of sprays. Different spray types have different thermal abilities. The distance, so how far away the sprayer is from the face of the tool. Is the sprayer only an inch and a half or two inches away from the face of the tool? You know, or is it 15 to 18 inches away? So pressure and distance play hand in hand. And, and we wanna say that the closer the spray or the higher the pressure, the more it's gonna overcome that Leidenfrost effect. And then the die temp, which we were given that at 600 degrees Fahrenheit. So some of the other questions or the points we were given is that we were told that we have 12 seconds of spray time. So are we using a manifold? Are we spraying with a manifold? And we have 10 spray tubes or 20 spray tubes. And each spray tube has a 40,000 orifice. So that would give us our total spray orifice size. Or are we spraying with a robot? And we basically just have one spray point and we move that robot all over the spray area, okay? Because 12 seconds with 20 spray tubes or 12 seconds with one spray tube it is gonna be a little bit different the, uh, value to the amount of spray we're applying. We were given an 80 degree Fahrenheit spray temperature. Well, th there are several studies and if you wanna email me, I can send you some of the links to those studies but there are several studies that, that state or equivocally that spray temperature, so whether that's 60 degrees or whether it's 80 degrees, is really irrelevant to the actual heat removal from the tool. So if we're keeping our, our spray temperature refrigerated and we're spraying it on it at 50 degrees versus 80 degrees, frankly, that's gonna have very little difference on heat removal from the tool because the Delta T Okay, so we have delta T of the spray, say it's 60 degrees or 80 degrees, we have a delta T of 20, or the delta T of our spray temperature to our dye temperature. So 80 degrees to 600 degrees, so a 520 degree delta T. So this delta T is going to overcome any spray differences. So spray temperature, although it's nice to know, is really irrelevant. 
And then we have 95% evaporation. Well, do we have actually have total evaporation or do we actually see some runoff, some runoff off the face of the tool? And then, you know, we assume 95% with a 5% deposition rate onto the face of the die. So those were some of the points. Now, part of that second, the second part of that question is, you know, what's a good rule of thumb? Okay, so this is from a report that was done in 2015. Yeah, I know this is a little dated and it's about five years old, but this was from a survey from a large expanse of die cast companies. And those companies had machines ranging from 400 ton to 1600 ton die cast machines. And what was determined from that study of die cast companies and spray times is that this would be a good rule of thumb, thumb to follow. And, and once again, this is from the David Schwamm paper and if anybody wants this, I can get you this. But basically the rule of thumb is for the tonnage machine, that would be the overall spray time. So a 400 ton would be four seconds, 1000 ton would be 10 seconds, 1600 ton would be 16 seconds. Now, this particular study didn't go bigger than 1,600 ton, but we, we get the idea that if we're spraying for uh, 18 seconds and, and we've got a 1,000 ton machine, we have some waste in there. We have, we, we have the ability to look at our internal cooling and actually remove spray. The spray is not necessarily there to remove heat. It does remove heat but it's, that's not its primary purpose. Primary purpose of spray is just to get that coating on the face of the tool. So that and when we make that next shot, that coating helps the lubricity, helps the, the flow distance, helps the material not you know, thermally uh, contact the steel. So it coats the steel, and then it actually gives us the release from the, the dye itself. So spray purpose is, is all of those items but its main purpose is not heat removal. If we're using it for heat removal, then we need to look at our internal cooling to help us solve some of those points. To give more further detail to this particular question, I just have this example. And, and, and when we talk about thermal balance, we're, we're talking about all of the heat that goes into the process. So if we have an A360 casting, so aluminum, if the casting is seven and a half pounds, single cavity die, the shot weight is 2.9 pounds. So that's the gate uh, runner overflows, you know, the entire casting, or, or that's the, the, the gate and runners. We add these two together to get the actual shot weight of 10.5 pounds, 10.49 pounds. Our metal temperature is 1300 degrees, liquid is 11.5, solid is 1035. 1300 is a little hot, by the way, for aluminum. You know, I would recommend 1220, 1250. So we, we have these inputs. We have an ejection temperature of 750 degrees. So we can then calculate, based on the heat capacity of the steel and the thermal conductivity and the amount of BTUs from 10.49 pounds of material being put into our tool, that we can say that we have 3,352 BTUs per shot. And if we have a shot rate of 57 shots per hour, then we have 193,100 BTUs per hour. Okay, so equate this 3,352 to the 480 BTUs that the spray was removing. Basically, that's 14%. So we have uh, 480 that we calculated in the very beginning, 480 BTUs of, of heat being removed by spray. And we have 3,352 in this example of total BTUs. If that spray were used on this particular tool, that would be 14% of the heat removal by the spray cycle. So when we spray on a die, this is from a 1976 paper, and we, we have three different types of cooling that's gonna take place. We have film boiling. Now, most of our lubes do not cool in this fashion. We have transition boiling and nucleate boiling. 
this nucleate boiling is what we see. So the majority of our heat removal comes from nucleate boiling on the surface of the tool. We get a little bit of transition boiling, but this is the major point. So as we understand the different types of, of boiling that occurs on the face of the tool and know that we're gonna see transition boiling and nucleate boiling. So in the transition phase of, of boiling, we're gonna only see maybe 5% or less of the total heat removed by the spray. The nucleate boiling can see as high as 28%. Remember, we calculated on our, our example, you know, right around 14%. So it's in the realm of, of nucleate boiling and that's gonna equate to the heat removal from the spray. So we calculate our BTUs in, we know between, you know, 5% and 20% is gonna be what typical dye spray is gonna remove. The rest of that heat has to be removed from the internal cooling. One other point or one very important point is the lube chemistry itself. So these are three different lubes and this is dye temperature and, and this is time. So this is a silicon-based lubricant, a graphite-based lubricant, and a standard water-based lubricant. And we can see the temperature drop from spray. Now this was done on a steel plate in uh, DCE uh, 10344, January 2003. But the real point here is chemistry plays a big part. So the type of dye lube you're using is very important to how much BTUs are gonna be removed from the actual uh, spray process. So understanding that even within the water-based lubes, we could graph many different water-based lubes and see different thermal transfer rates. So the type of lube we're spraying is important to, to how this uh, lube is actually gonna remove uh, heat. So some conclusions. When, when we boil the material off, we're going to see nucleate boiling. We wanna make sure we don't have a steam blanket. So the heat, so we actually penetrate that and we actually get the a lube to contact the steel surface. That's, that's when we uh, then remove the amount of heat and then we start wetting out our lubes. All of these lubes are pressure dependent. So depending on our spray pressure. So if we have an air filter on our die cast machine and all of a sudden we lose spray pressure, we're gonna lose the ability of that lube to actually contact the surface of the tool in the spray time that we've allotted. So we wanna make sure we maintain our systems, maintain our air pressure and make sure that we have good filtration going into our sprayer. Spray angle is important. We want that to be as perpendicular to the die as possible. Many studies have shown that if we get this angle off, our heat removal drops dramatically. Chemistry matters. So what's the lube made of and how, how well does that lube remove heat? Remember that <clears throat> the heat removal depth is pretty small. So it's gonna be less than an inch you know, into the surface of the tool. But, and then the, the largest heat removal is actually gonna you know, come from the internal cooling uh, of the tool. One last comment is that we get better heat removal if we're using an intermittent spray pattern or pulse spray. Now, in, in this particular question answer, uh, I'm not prepared to go into all the detail of pulse spray, but if anybody wants information on that, I have information and, and it's a good thing because there are many die casters out there and I have some case studies showing the lube amount reduction and actual cycle time improvement running exactly the same die in exactly the same size machine. And then all they've done is gone to pulse spray. And you can use pulse spray with water-based systems and you can use pulse spray with oil-based systems. So just a, a point of interest that we, we can actually see cycle time reduction by going to pulse spray. Okay, so spray can have large effects on our dye temperature. You know, so if we got hot spots or porosity, spray is very important for that. Spray behavior is not always intuitive. 
Um, so if people are out there just adjusting spray patterns and, and spray amounts, uh, that, that's not always a good thing for the process. Okay. The majority of heat is going to be removed from the internal cooling system. So the type of dye material is important. We have a question coming up to discuss this particular point. So we're gonna get a lot more into uh, thermal conductivity and heat removal. And then, you know, we need to have an internal cooling system to complete that overall thermal control and thermal balance that we're looking for in our die cast process. Question number three, so getting right, right from spray, spray patterns and, and heat removal. Now this question is, we don't seem to be able to get a good representation of thermal condition when simulating an envelope. The steel temperature does not show very much variance between it and H13. Is there a simulating package that will give a better indication of what steel temperature is when simulating amboloid? Okay, so we're gonna talk about this question in, in a couple points also. So for this question, I'm gonna review very quickly how simulation packages function, and then what are the inputs into simulation packages in that thermal package that, that they use. We're gonna talk about the thermal conductivity materials. We're gonna review the heat flow equation because you can calculate this and you can actually verify that your simulation software is working correctly. We're gonna talk about how thermal conductivity fits into that equation. And, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna recommend some additional material for further learning on this subject. So, the, the question was, you know, we want to be able to find the right software for our process, and then we want to make sure that when we're simulating different steel materials, and below and H13, that we're actually seeing that difference in our simulation packages. So when we use our simulation package, we're going to import some CAD files, STL files, and then the simulation package is going to work on a mesh. So it doesn't really matter which simulation package you're using. It's going to, depending on the mesh that it develops, each mesh type, so whether it's uh, 1.1 million elements or 650,000 elements or 74,000 elements, the, the higher the mesh, the different, we're going we're gonna to see a difference between the same simulating package at different mesh levels. So my real point here is when, when you're using a simulation package, make sure that your, your mesh and the way the simulation package works is that it's doing the same thing every time. You don't wanna run a simulation at 1.1 million units elements and then simulate at 74,000 elements. And I'll show you why, okay? Because with different meshes, we're gonna get different results, different fill results. So this is a lighter mesh, this is a heavier mesh. And, and we can see that we're seeing different thermal activity in the tool. So solidification rate results are gonna be different on the different meshes. And when we're looking at that solidification, you know, what's the last point to solidify and, and where are we gonna see shrink is gonna vary based on the mesh. So we wanna make sure that we're using a consistent mesh when we're simulating that. And then if we're simulating spray in our process, you know, we're gonna see different spray patterns based on different meshes also. Just understand that we, when we're doing it, we wanna do it consistently. All right, so moving on to the in, inputs. So the question was, you know, what's the best simulation package? I don't know that the simulation package is as important as making sure that what we're simulating is the appropriate thing for what, what our tool is gonna to be made out of. So when we're simulating, we're gonna to wanna to know the die cast aluminum material. So this is a 9% aluminum, 3% uh, copper material, and it has a uh, solidus point of 630 to 650 degrees Celsius, okay? The dye material, uh, it's a you know, chromium, moly, vanadium material, um, and, and this is for, for the warm-up cycles, and then our cooling water, and, and what temperature our cooling water is gonna be running at. So, we want to make sure that we know what the inputs are, and we want to make sure that the individual that's simulating our material is using all the correct materials 
during that simulation. For the other inputs, we're going to want to know the heat transfer, so of the diecast material in the mold and in between the mold and then the mold and the cooling. So these are heat transfer rates. And then we want to know, are, you know, are we going to be using spray, blow off, or, you know, what are the, do we have any delays in our process? So when we talk about materials, we're, we have different types of material and we're going to have a thermal conductivity. So this is in, in BTUs per foot uh, per degree Fahrenheit, and this is uh, watts per millikevin. So these are just different materials just to show you that between dye steel and aluminum, dye steel is a very poor thermal conductor relative to aluminum or other materials. So we can see that you know concrete's poor and insulation board is even worse, which we would expect for thermal conductivity. All right, so let's talk about heat flow. So the, the question was, what's a good simulation package? Uh, I would say a simulation package that is using the proper materials and then the proper equations. So we want to know what's our heat flow in either BTUs per hour or kilojoules per hour. And, and we want to be able to calculate, this is the formula for calculating heat flow in a material. So if we're using different materials, we're going to have different heat flows. So we have a core made of H13, and then we simulate a core made of amboloy. They're going to have different thermal conductivities. That's this K value. That's the thermal conductivity of the material. The A is the projected area of the particular unit. So this core is going to have some area. So whether we simulate it with H13 or simulate it with amboloy, it's going to have some specific area. And then we're going to have the distance the heat must flow. That's either going to be in inches or, or millimeters or centimeters. And then we're going to have the dye temperature and then the water line, the surface of the water line temperature or delta T. So this is the heat flow equation. And when we look at that heat flow equation, we're, we're calculating um, the heat flow in the material. And one point to make, to make really quickly is that as the depth increases, so we take a water line and we put it deep into our steel, then the amount of heat flow is going to decrease. So that makes sense. The further the cooling line is from the face of the tool or from our die casting, the less heat flow we're going to see because the heat's got to travel further in the steel. And frankly, steel has a really poor thermal conductivity relative to other materials. Okay, so let's further discuss this, the K value. So now we can see that these are the K values or the thermal conductivity values for different types of material. So H13 is gonna have 1.25. Amboloy is gonna be 5.9. So the difference between here and here is that Amboloy has 4.7 times greater thermal conductivity over H13. So not, not necessarily pinning down which simulation package to use, but make sure whoever is simulating this is using this type of equation or that the package is using this type of heat flow equation and that when you're using an amyloid versus an H13 insert, that you can see a tremendous difference. You should absolutely see a difference. So if your, your particular uh, simulation package doesn't show that, then, then it's the wrong simulation package. So you wanna make sure that your package can put in these type of K values is using this type of formulation, and you can see a difference between H13 and amboloid. So to sum this up, um, you know, we teach thermal uh, heat transfer in our dye design course. Uh, we want to make sure that we maintain a good thermal balance, a good thermal balance from cover to ejector, and a good thermal balance within each half of the tool. Okay, so and that's going to all be based on the thermal conductivity. 
thermal capacity, and heat flow. And all of those are part of the NADCA die design course. When you're looking at the software packages, um, we want to make sure that we have good starting parameters. Our inputs are good, so we can simulate and then compare results between the different types of material, and we definitely see a difference in all those materials. This would be a, a good follow-up material for anybody wanting more information. Uh, this is the uh, die design, uh, die casting tooling, uh, E506. And uh, this is available for download or hard copy. But this has all the equations and, and it goes through step-by-step -step examples for calculating uh, heat capacity, uh, thermal conductivity, and showing you know, water line depth and water line locations and, and how they're actually calculated in our tooling. Now your simulation packages do a lot of the similar results. We just wanna make sure that the two are meshing and that we're seeing when we're simulating different materials, we're getting you know, similar results to what we would expect. So this last question of the day is uh, pretty broad. So the question is, what is the way to get rid of porosity? You know, isn't that a loaded question? Frankly, you know, this could take several hours to discuss and, and to go through all of the causes and reasons. I'm gonna do an abridged version. So we're gonna talk through this in about 10, maybe 15 minutes. When we're talking about porosity, we're talking about two types of porosity. We're talking about shrinkage porosity and gas porosity. So how do you get rid of porosity? You first need to understand it. You need to understand what it is, because if you're trying to solve shrinkage issues and you have really gas in there but no shrinkage, it, you're, you're not gonna solve it. You're, you're gonna just spin your wheels. So understanding the type of porosity you're dealing with is very important. This is a diagram I showed uh, in, in a couple episodes ago. And, and basically, this is just showing a cause and effect diagram for porosity. So, you know, is our process controlled? What's our die temperature? Where's the trapped gases coming from? You know, or do we have our lubrication and our dye lube and our tip lube, all sources of porosity. Then we have design of the runner, design of the part, you know, the machine and the material that we're casting it with. All of the, these things can lead to porosity. So how do we get rid of porosity? First, understand it. When we're looking at porosity, gas is the single largest problem in die casting. And so knowing where gas come from, is it trapped air? Is it steam? Is it you know, gas from our lubricants? And then hydrogen itself can be a problem. So knowing you know, what type of, of gas it is, is gonna help us solve a gas porosity problem. So we can you know, do degassing, we can use a porous plug that we're putting argon or nitrogen through. So we can use these porous plugs to help remove hydrogen from our material. We can use a rotary degassing unit, uh, you know, once again, either using argon or nitrogen. And, and here's just a quick video of, of a rotary degassing unit showing the air bubbles, and we want really fine bubbles when we're uh, degassing material. Okay, so when we degas our material, we, we're going to um, see, so these are pucks. And, and these are pucks taken from a breakdown furnace. And this puck was, so this is from May of 2019 from a die caster in the Midwest. This was taken at 7 a.m. This one was taken at 9 a.m. This was no degassing. This one was degassed. So we can see the difference. Now you take this metal, you, you put it in a, in a vacuum system and, and you can actually check the density. So the density check. And it also shows you the amount of hydrogen that's entrained in your metal, that's in your breakdown or holding furnaces. So by putting it under a low atmosphere, a vacuum system, it actually allows the bubbles to grow. So we can see the amount of hydrogen. This is all hydrogen in our material. This is not degassed. This is the same material that's then degassed. So degassing removes, removes gas. So hydrogen is just one source. Other sources are air trapped in our shot sleeve, in our gating system, in our cavities. So all of these are sources of gas. 
that can be trapped in our system. This is a video, so write this down. It's HTTPS backslash backslash vimeo.com backslash 311-670-901. This is a old Garber video. Dr. Garber is the individual that started uh, calculating the critical slow shot velocities. If you wanna see how air can be trapped in your chamber itself, in your shot sleeve, these are good videos to review. These are great videos to show individuals just coming into the diecast arena. So, so new employees, employees that, that are just moving into process control, because these videos kind of show you that we need to make sure that our shot system is using critical slow shot. If we're too fast, if we're too slow, we're gonna trap air in our shot system. So just a, a point of air trapped in our shot sleeves, it's just gonna be air that's gonna be trapped in our die castings. So gas porosity and calculating the critical slow shot velocity is based on this equation, where K is 22.8 uh, inches per second for calculating critical slow shot, and it's percent full in the cold chamber times the square root of the tip diameter. If anybody wants this formula, email me. I will send it to you. We also need to know that we've got good venting and vacuum. So whether we have vacuum systems or we're just using venting, you know, if we don't get the air out, then air is trapped. So we've got to make sure our vents are open. We got to make sure if we're using a vacuum system that it's it's functioning and that it's not plugged. So whether we're using a, a vent block or we're using a vacuum system or a vent block with a vacuum, um, all of these devices are gonna be used to put on the outside of our die casting. And once again, whether we're using venting and we're filling from one location and evacuating air from another, if we trap air in here and, and these overflows are plugged or our vacuum's plugged or our vents are plugged, all we're doing is trapping air in our die casting. So how do we get rid of porosity? Make sure we have good venting. Make sure that our vacuums are open. Make sure they're functioning. You know, lubrication. So whether it's plunger lube or excess dye lube or water or hydraulic leaks, all of those things lead to porosity in our die castings. So we can see staining on the castings. This is a brown staining that comes from plunger lubes. We can see black staining from our dye lubes. We can see water drip marks from water that's being dripped into our cavity or leaked into our cavity or hydraulic fluid that's coming from our hydraulic cylinders. All of those are sources of gas porosity. Okay, so we've kind of exhausted in, in three minutes or less gas porosity, but gas is one source. Okay, another source is gonna be shrink porosity. Shrink porosity uh, takes place because when we're feeding our casting, this is our die casting, as we feed our casting, the metal solidifies from the outside in. We end up with this liquid material and then our gates freeze off. So this is our gate, this is our runner. Once our gates are frozen, we can't feed this anymore and we're gonna see shrink voids inside of here. So we then end up with shrink porosity. Now, shrink is not simple. So and porosity in general is not simple but the first thing you have to do is start to understand it. What's gas, what's shrink, and then what are the solutions for solving shrink problems? What are the solutions for solving gas problems? Once we started looking at those solutions and evacuating our molds, feeding our shrink, okay, shrink is a thermal condition. So we wanna make sure we understand what's our intensification pressure, what's our dye temperature, when do our gates freeze off? So casting configuration, the thermal aspects of shrink need to be understand, understood so that we either are going to feed it or we're going to cool it. We're going to thermally change the area or we're going to be able to put more metal into that area to feed the shrink that's going to exist. So to summarize this, we have gas and shrink porosity. Together, 
you know, we can get gas and shrink. We can get hydrogen and shrink. We can get trapped gases and shrink. So all of these are gonna to form together to make the porosity in our die casting, knowing that shrink is going to form at the neutral thermal axis inside every die casting. Shrink porosity can, can affect you know, most as aspects of the die process, die cast process. And there are various forms of shrink porosity. There are specific actions to move, reduce, or eliminate shrink porosity. So other forms of shrink porosity are sinks, leakers, cracks due to shrink in die castings. All of these defects are linked right back to shrink porosity. So if you'd like more information on this and more follow-up material, that has several guides, not just one. We have, we have multiple guides and there are multiple things you can use to understand the formation of porosity in the die cast process and how to eliminate and correct those gas conditions and shrink conditions that are inside our die cast uh, products that we're, we're making. So once again, porosity in general, we could discuss this for several hours and discuss each one of the inputs and each one of the items that lead to the corrective action for solving shrink and gas issues. So did this spark any questions? Any questions for you guys? If you have additional questions in the future, please email them. You can email them to me or you can email them to Athena and then we will answer those questions for future sessions of Ask Paul. So we, we basically just covered four questions today with a lot of detail. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I would be happy to answer those at this point in time. Thanks, Paul. So as Paul said, we're going to open it up for questions. There are a few ways that you can ask questions. Within your control panel, there is a text box. If you click within the text box, type your question in and hit send. We will get that in on our end. The next thing that you can do is if you're calling in on a phone or if you have a mic set up, you can click on that little hand icon. We'll go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. Again, um, please feel free to send us in any additional questions that you might have. Um, you can always submit those on the form page. Um, you can navigate to any of the previously aired episodes of Just Ask Paul. Um, if you go onto our website and you navigate to the technology section, there is actually just a little um, tab that is entitled Just Ask Paul. Um, so you just click on that, you'll go and be able to get to all of the previously aired episodes as well as where that form submission page is. Uh, so with that, we're going to hang on the line just for a couple minutes here and see if anything comes through. All right, I don't see any hands raised and I don't see any questions coming through. 
Um, so with that, I am going to call it for the day. Again, you can reach out to us at any time, um, either directly to Paul um, or through that forms page that is set up so that you can submit additional questions. Uh, so with that, everybody, thank you for attending today. And Paul, thank you for answering some questions. And we look forward to seeing you all on another webinar. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Bye.